Hi, I'm Vanessa Ivey with the Deschutes Historical Museum. This year, our Historical Haunts of Downtown Bend Walking Tour celebrates its 10th anniversary. In 2010, we started this tour as an idea, bringing the history of Bend to our community in a new way. We never imagined its staying power, and today it's become one of the Historical Society's biggest fall fundraisers. Thank you for embracing this event and making it the fan favorite that it's become. Now, we didn't want to miss our milestone anniversary, so we've put together this virtual version of the tour for you, weaving the unknown mystery with the history of Ben's downtown district. We promised you something different this year, so without further ado, grab your treats, get comfy, and get ready to get your haunt on with the Deschutes Historical Museum's Historical Haunts of Downtown Bend walking tour virtual style. Masks not required. begin our historical haunts of downtown Bend walking tour here at the Deschutes Historical Museum. Then we'll weave our way through the downtown district with Doug, Stephanie, and myself as your tour guides ending at the Tower Theater. If you're ready, let's get started. By 1913, the railroad had arrived, opening up the central part of Oregon and creating a population boom here in Bend. Families were moving in and the old school was becoming overcrowded and outdated. So in 1913, the community passed its school bond for $23,000, which included land, labor, and materials to construct a new modern school. The new school had central heating, electricity, indoor plumbing, and fire safety precautions on all three floors, including a metal fire escape on the south side of the building that's still used today. The Broster House brothers, Ed and George, oversaw the building's construction. And in June of 1914, the outside of the school was complete. Only the roof needed finishing before moving to the interior. Without warning, tragedy fell, literally, from the roof. It was May 30th, and George was up here on the roof inspecting a load of timber that had earlier been delivered for construction. His brother, Ed, was on the main floor of the building working on the interior. The newspaper reports that day in the bulletin said that many men were up on the roof doing work, but none of them noticed that an accident had occurred or even that George had fallen through this large hole that would later be where the stairwell was placed. His body, plummeting three floors, landed on the floor below, on the main floor, killing him instantly. I'm standing close to the spot that George landed on that day in May. Here at the museum, volunteers and staff have what they call George moments. These aren't harmful or scary experiences, but they can be helpful. Here in the library and on the third floor is where George is mostly active. 
You might be doing research and a book falls off the shelf and the page that you open is the necessary material you need. Or you've lost something and you call out for George for help and you find it in a location you've actually searched a number of times prior. One of the more vivid stories of a George experience occurred in the early 2000s. A local pianist was here practicing and, and limbering up on this piano behind me before a concert. The piano at that time was located in the library. And hearing this beautiful music throughout the museum, a staff member came downstairs and continued to do their work in the library. The pianist turned to the staff person and asked, who's the man that's sitting across from you watching you? And the staff member said, what are you talking about? There's nobody here, it's just you and me. Well, later, after the pianist was done practicing, they walked past an image that we have in the foyer of Ed and George Brosterhaus and pointed to one of the men in the photos and said, that's the man that I saw. And he was pointing to George. just crossed the street and behind me in that beautiful building was once the home to the Bend Amateur Athletic Club, uh, the BAAC. A century ago, this building was the heart of this community. It's where your kids graduated from. It's where dances and balls, including Halloween masquerade parties occurred, lectures and even sporting events, especially since its auditorium and gymnasium could seat over 3,000 3,000 people. When it opened in July of 1918, it had cost $50,000 and had used 300,000 locally made bricks. It had a swimming pool. It had multiple bowling alley lanes. It had reading rooms, an on-site caretaker, and was also at one time where the Deschutes County Library was housed. But by the end of the summer, the pandemic flu had come to Central Oregon. Teachers were knocking on doors, telling parents not to send their kids to school. How to make a mask was front page news in the local paper. And public group congregating inside was not encouraged. October 17th, Bend was in lockdown. Wear a mask, wash your hands often, cough into your elbow, and stay quarantined were necessary measures urged upon everyone. The 1st of November, BAAC was turned over to the health officials to be used as a makeshift hospital. Forty cots were set up in the gym, and a shout-out to nurses and health aides was made. So everybody joined in. The strung wires across through the big building up there, put sheets on there to separate the beds from each other and made private rooms out of the whole thing, a bed to each section that was set off. And that's the way it was handled. The flu was on the move. Three days after Bend, Bend's lockdown, more than 300 cases were reported across Oregon and Washington. Here in Bend, 18 within a 48 hour period. I'm standing in what was the lot behind the Bend Amateur Athletic Club. Dr. Donovan would have left those that had died in the gym here for the local undertaker to pick up. And stories are told that he'd do that at night, so not to alarm the community. Now, by the end of 1919, more than 50 million people had died across the globe from the pandemic. Here in Bend, 
36 were reported. Although the museum has not heard stories of the unusual nature occurring at this location, we thought it was appropriate to have it on our tour this year, especially since the role that it played in another historic pandemic was essential. In 2004, McMinimins purchased this property and put up the first Oregon McMinimins east of the Cascades. 84 years earlier though, another first occurred on this same location, the first parochial school in Central Oregon. Father Luke Sheehan's dream. Father Luke came to Bend in 1910, an Irish Catholic priest. His first services were held down by the river in what was once the one-room schoolhouse. Not until 1936 did Father Luke's dream come true. St. Francis School opened with 145 students for grades one through eight in four classrooms. Sadly, Father Luke would die a following year. But over time, this school grew and outgrew its space. Today, St. Francis School is on the northeast side of town. Guests staying in the rooms located in the newer addition added in the 1950s have reported hearing children running up and down the hallways above them, but there has never been a second floor. Guests have been woken in the middle of the night by someone poking them. A nun may frown upon falling asleep in the classroom, but better a poke in the shoulder than a whack across the wrist. During the school's transformation, the construction crew assigned to the cinema for the pub stored their gear for the night, locked up, and went home. The next morning, the returned workers discovered their carefully coiled electric cords pulled apart and woven into intricate Celtic knots. The men named their visitor Kate. Today, a painting hangs next to the theater's entrance illustrating the midnight prank. When McMinimins originally purchased Old St. Francis School, they also purchased a series of homes that ran along Lava and Louisiana and turned those homes into rental bungalows. One of those bungalows was named The Nunnery and was known for otherworldly activity. One night, a couple had gone into their room, got ready for bed, put their phone on the nightstand and went to sleep. The next morning, there was a photo of them asleep on their phone and the door had been locked. Another story that was told to us was as a group staying in the nunnery. And there is the smallest of the rooms was facing Louisiana. It had a bunk bed. And the gal that evening who slept in that room complained that she was awake all night because she could feel somebody kicking their feet underneath the mattress, pushing her up, pushing the mattress up with her on it. And at the same time, she could hear somebody banging on the window, not someone banging on the outside, trying to get the inside person's attention. No, it was someone from the inside banging on the window to get out. Floor cleaners would come in to do the carpets and they got permission to set up video and audio equipment. They never got anything on their video, but they always got something on the audio. Laughter, talking, never something you could understand, but in the background they could hear cabinets opening and doors closing. Now, 
In 2014, McMinimins needed to expand, so they sold the bungalows. The company who purchased the, the bungalows, the houses, came up and did an inspection. When she went into the nunnery, there were coasters in the kitchen on the counter. She walked around taking photos of the house, and when she came back into the kitchen, those nicely stacked coasters were spread all over the counter and all over the floor, and there was no one else except her in the room. When they were ready to move the houses, they all had to be loaded onto trucks to move them down to Sun River. The only truck to break down was the one carrying the nunnery. So we posed the question, was the ghosts going with the house or did they stay on the property? In 2016, Ed's house, the building behind me, opened up and we were told that the elevator sporadically broke down for no reason. Lights went on and off all by themselves. The heating units would often go off for no apparent reason. And at night, footsteps, phantom footsteps, could be heard walking down the corridors. Ben's first recorded fire took place in the early morning of April 27, 1905. Hugh O'Kane's saloon was ablaze and community volunteers fought to control its spread with wet blankets and barrels of water. Although the saloon was lost, the downtown district had been saved. That summer, a new fire protective system was installed consisting of street hydrants, hose carts, fire hose, ladders and nozzles, and at a cost of $1,400. The water tank on the nearby hill provided adequate water pressure for the new system. In 1919, the Bend Fire Department was formed, and the following year, the new home to the fire department was completed. This year, the fire hall celebrates its 100th birthday. When completed in 1920, it was home to two fire vehicles, paid personnel on duty 24-7, and Fire Chief Tom Carlin at the helm. In 2001, the fire hall closed, relocating the fire department to the east side of town. On a warm evening in the restaurant, the large engine doors were open and the early dinner crowd trickled in. A young woman assigned to serve in the large room with the rock fireplace moved between patrons and noticed a man sitting in front of the fireplace, the smell of smoke clinging to him. She remembers the smell distinctly as it was wood smoke and not that of a cigarette. Plus, there was no fire lit. Throughout her shift, she noticed the man never orders food or drink and always the smell of smoke near him. As the restaurant gets busy, she approaches the man, they need the table, only to see that he is no longer there. Just the faint smell of smoke lingering in the place he occupied. The server thought nothing of it until later when she saw photos of the fire hall in its early days. The uniform the crew had on was identical to the clothing the older man was wearing. Staccato closed its doors on July 21, 2010, and today it is the Brick House. Behind me is the Long Crow Bungalow. This wooden building is the oldest on Wall Street. In 1912, a fire broke out burning the north end of Wall Street and its businesses all but one. Due to the quick thinking of Smith Hardware store owners, Cora and Nick Smith, they covered the sides and the roof of their building with wet blankets and sheets. While the fire continued to roar down the street, the fire brigade kept the linens wet and doused with water, saving the structure. This, love, this is a love story, one that has a happy ending. Nick and Cora Smith were one of the town's early enterprising couples. 
Bend was small, with less than 200 people when the newlyweds arrived in 1902. Nick quickly became involved in the community. He cleared roads, laid sidewalks, and built the three-and-a-half-foot rock wall, forever changing Main Street to Wall Street. In 1909, he opened the Smith Hardware Store and moved his family of five to the apartment above the business. Nick and Cora worked together, making their store a success. But in the 30s, the Depression forced them to close the business. Then, during the hard winter of 55, Nick fell ill with pneumonia and died in his home, Cora caring for him till the end. Five days later, Cora followed him in death, still wearing the locket Nick had given her on their wedding, together to the end. Staff at the once Ben Bungalow shared stories of how pictures hung on the wall for display at night would find the same pictures on the counter the next morning, not fallen, but as though someone placed them with care on their countertop. Even the museum's handyman has had a run-in with the Smiths. During his visit to the apartment, he has opened the locked front door just in time to hear the doors shut. Only the doors were all open when he inspected the apartment. In the 1970s, when the shoe clinic was using the business space downstairs, the manager would lock up at the end of the night, go into his office to do his the business, and he would hear a bang, bang, bang on the ceiling. Could that be Cora calling Nick to dinner? Marjorie would tell us a story how mom would bang the end of the broom on the floor to let Nick know supper was being served and he better get upstairs. And then there's the possibility that it's not Nick and Cora at all, but Marjorie, their daughter. Marjorie moved back to Bend after her parents died, taking a local teaching position. She lived above the old store until her death in 2010. She was just shy of her 100th birthday. Our final stop is here, outside the Lark and the Tower Theater. Although built decades apart, these two buildings have a connected history both in the physical and the paranormal. This is the shrine to our office ghost and possibly the theater ghost as well. And it came about because one day staff came in and found this key, part of this key, laying on the ground. Now, it was laying right about where we were standing, but it had, but the other part of the key, the broken off part of the key, was in a lock jammed into a lock over here in a desk. This key had been in this lock for a while, just sitting there. Nobody had been opening or closing it or locking it or unlocking it. It was just there, as people are wont to leave their keys in places until they actually need them. So when the staff member came in and found this key in the middle of the room, I was like, well, how did that get there? And what knocked it off? Well, it's not really clear what knocked it off because if you knocked it off, it would have gone that way, to the left of the key, or this way to the right of the key. Pure physics, correct? But for it to pop off, break, and then fly across the room, all the way to the middle of the room, seems to be paranormal. 
So we had a person come in and uh, do a little uh, uh, analysis, a little cleansing of the room as well. And they said, oh yes, definitely, uh, there, is, uh, there is some apparition, there is somebody who um, is still around, um, doesn't seem to be angry or upset with anything, seems to be a very friendly, a friendly person. Um, and this was, in fact, we're on the second floor of the building um, next to the tower above a Lark uh, Home Goods. This was the original um, home and apartment of Edgar and Gladys Thompson. And they had their home up here. They ran a, a music store downstairs. Uh, and they had their uh, bedrooms and their kitchens and their living room and everything was up here. So it was a living quarter and it had plumbing and everything else. So this was, this was a legitimate uh, apartment uh, back in the day in downtown Bend. So what we did is we put together a little shrine and we have the key just to make sure it's there. Uh, we did, uh, the the, the uh, expert that came in said, you know, you want to burn a candle if you can, so we have a little electric battery powered candle, uh, which I guess I should just turn that on, right? And um, we believe that she uh, liked vodka from all, all accounts of the, the stories. Uh, and so we have a little uh, flask, a little bottle of vodka here. Uh, and this With the arrival of the railroad, Thompson found his business growing and needed to expand his shop. So in 1916, he bought property on Wall Street and constructed the Thompson Building. His business thrived, and two years later, he sold his furniture inventory and focused just on music, advertising in the Ben Bulletin as a piano tuner, selling pianos, photographs, and musical instruments. So in uh, January of 2015, the Tower Theater Foundation, which is the nonprofit that owns and operates the Tower Theater venue, uh, decided that we needed to expand our offices. Uh, and the second floor um, office suites above Lark, next door, immediately south of the, of the tower, became available. Um, and we, we at the time were at the old um, uh, post office uh, just south on Franklin. So we uh, spent a couple of weeks uh, renovating and basically repainting and fixing up the, the suite of offices here. Uh, we didn't do a whole lot to it, but basically left the floor plan uh, and the footprint of the entire building uh, the same as it was uh, when, uh, when it was rented. So as we were reno renovating the entire space and, space and fixing it up and cleaning it up, um, uh, I decided uh, as, as this office was going to uh, be my uh, temporary home, as it were, uh, we wanted to sand the floors. The floor had been covered with carpeting uh, for years and years and years. So we ripped up the carpeting um, and then um, refinish the wood. Uh, and it took a, a couple of days to strip it down and then to recover it. And for those of you familiar with uh, uh, floor refinishing, uh, you have to refinish it uh, and then let it dry and then refinish it and, and polish it and put another coat, uh, clear coat on and let it dry. Uh, and, and so it takes a couple of days for it to actually uh, seal uh, and settle. Um, so we were in the process uh, in January of 2015 of doing this uh, refinishing of the floor uh, in this particular uh, office. Uh, and over in this corner, inexplicably was a small mound of dirt. It was round, it was conical shaped, it was somewhat looked like a sort of a miniature Pilot Butte. Uh, and uh, we I looked at it and thought, well that's interesting. Um, maybe it's dust or dirt that's been swept or piled up together. There were no brush marks, there's no broom marks anywhere, it was just a small pile of dirt. Um, then we thought, well, wait a second, could it have come from uh, the vents or anything from the ceiling? Could it have come down? And we looked up and there's really nothing um, that would have indicated uh, any kind of dirt that would be falling from the, the ceiling. So then we thought, well, maybe it had come from uh, the uh, uh, renovations that were going on below downstairs. Maybe it had come up through the cracks in some shape or form, or maybe there was a, an opening in uh, in the, uh, the the flooring here, so we looked around and and nothing was open. It is as you see it now, um, with the floorboards uh, intact and every uh, all the 
the, the, the wood in place, none of the wood, none of the, um, the floorboards or none of the, the flooring had been picked up or moved or changed and we had not done anything to it at all. So then we thought, well, the only really other thing that could possibly have happened to get that dirt there, well, maybe the window had been opened uh, and the, and the, the, uh, the, the wind uh, blew some dirt into the area. Yeah, well, that would make sense, but if that happened, there would be a trail or some kind of uh, non-symmetrical shape of the dirt. It doesn't make any sense that the dirt was very nicely formed and just piled there. So that became a question mark of how did that happen and why did that happen? And, and it was a question mark for several months. Uh, and and we, we, we sort of let it go and figured, well, we'll just sort of stay on the lookout for some, you know, maybe, maybe someday it'll become clear as to why that happened. Uh, we, we then were talking to the folks at the museum and going, coming across some photos of, of uh, Myrtle and Edgar uh, and the building back in 100 years ago uh, the, and the tower uh, and the history of the tower uh, because the tower in 2020 is actually 80 years old. It was built uh, and completed in 1940. And one picture that they had new to their files at the uh, museum was a picture of the actual groundbreaking in, uh, in, in early 1940 uh, as, as a first shovel of dirt is turned on the plot of land that will then become the site for the Tower Theater. It turns out that um, Edgar and uh, Myrtle uh, actually owned the property uh, next door, the, 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 the property that the tower is built on. Uh, then a few days later, uh, that same picture was uh, over at the, at the museum, and it became clear uh, that the same gentleman who had actually seen the uh, uh, Myrtle and Edgar uh, in the tower took a look at that picture and goes, wait a second, that person with the little hat on there, the lady, who, who is that? Well, that's uh, that's Myrtle Thompson. That's the uh, the owner of the uh, the building next to the tower, and it's the it's the ground breaking of the tower. And he said that's exactly the hat and the outfit that the woman was wearing that I saw seated in the back row of the theater. So we thought, okay, that's an interesting connection. But then it sort of, it dawned on all of us almost at the same time uh, that what was Myrtle watching when she was in that picture. Well, she was watching a groundbreaking. And what does a groundbreaking do? Well, it takes a shovel and it takes a little bit of dirt and it picks it up and it pours it down into a, a little small spot. It doesn't create a big ditch or a big trench. It simply makes a small mound of dirt. And that's the official groundbreaking of, the ta of any building. That's what Myrtle was watching in the photograph that we have that identifies her not only as the ghost, but as the owner of the, of the space and the building and the land. And then, 2015, what do we have? We have a ground, a, ma a small mound of dirt over here that seems to be very purposely put there and measured and very almost, I wouldn't say daintily, but very measured in, in a way to create this, uh, this uh, a mound that you couldn't ignore. You had to notice it. It wasn't going to go away. It wasn't dust. It wasn't uh, dust bunnies under a bed. It was actually placed, and then you go, oh, well, that's very much like a groundbreaking. And what were we doing here at the Tower Theater Foundation with Myrtle and Edgar's old apartment, but groundbreaking it and turning it into a facility to help run the tower, the land of which it was built on belonged to Edgar and Myrtle. So this, we believe, was, was her way of saying, welcome. We're breaking ground, we're taking new steps and new strides here in, in Bend uh, in 2015, but don't forget who's in charge. After Edgar's death in 1924, Myrtle continued managing the family business. In 1940, she sold the lot adjacent to the music store to the Tower Theatre Company. In three months of its groundbreaking, the Tower Theatre was open and operating. It was a magnificent theatre with floor and balcony seating for almost a thousand. Here you could catch the latest picture show or watch live entertainment.
A theater tradition around the world is that when the theater is empty or closed, you always leave on a light. You always leave on a light for the people and the spirits and the, the, the predecessors uh, of this theater and the ancestors of, of any theater. And so uh, typically it is a, uh, a single bulb on a stand and it rolls in and rolls out. And uh, we, so we have continued that tradition here and we have our own ghost light, which as you see, has been on all night, all weekends, and will, will stay on until our next show. So Doug, tell us what happened during that night performing here in the tower? I would love to. So the year was 2007. It was a Father's Day weekend and the play I was in was Mornings at Seven. It was a play based in 1940s, which we all know the Tower Theater was built in the 1940s. So we were doing a celebration. It's kind of like its anniversary. And as I was doing a performance, as actors, we try to ignore the fourth wall so that we do not see the audience in our um, view as we do our play, because they can be, sometimes get distracting. In behind me, there are some seats in the very back by the sound booth that for some reason my eye was drawn to these two elderly couples sitting in the back row watching the performance. And as they would sit there and I would do my performance and I would turn around and as I glanced to the back wall, they would be gone and I would go and do my performance and turn around again and they would be sitting there once more. And that went on throughout the whole play as the performance was going by. So at the end of the show, I was a little miffed because it was very distracting seeing people get up and down throughout the performance. And so I talked to the sound guy and he was informed me that there was no one next to him, that he had been back there by himself along that back wall. And we had a sound, our sound, our music for the play was um, 40s music. And it went missing the last performance. And to this day, they have never found the CD of all those 40s musics that we had for our play. So as I was saying earlier, this is where they were. Um, the lady was sitting in this chair and the man was sitting in this chair. And throughout the whole performance, they would be gone and be back and they would be exactly these two chairs every time. So when the expert um, was here and then left, she um, doesn't know me from anyone, doesn't know what I do here, um, but she, she left the building, came back up the stairs, came right to me and said, Myrtle wants a seat of her own at the theater. Myrtle lived next to the theater for another decade. When she died in 1958, she was buried next to Edgar in the Pilot Butte Cemetery. How appropriate for Edgar and Myrtle's music store to end up next to the theater. Today, the tower continues to be a social and cultural center for the community of Bend, known for its live music and its theater. Well, we've come to the end of our tour this year. Thank you for celebrating our 10th anniversary of the historical haunts of Downtown Bend walking tour with us. If you like this and want to see more from the Deschutes Historical Museum, click subscribe. And if you really like this, please consider making a donation to the Deschutes County Historical Society. We've placed a link in the description. This has been a crazy year and we appreciate your support. Be safe and happy Halloween.